so the station, its employees, or ownership. Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting babbled? Are you tired of this commercial? So am I. Well, these commercials may be old and boring, but the gospel we preach never is. Come study the Bible with the Church of Christ. We're meeting at 250 the Boulevard. Our new times are Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study and 10 a.m. for worship, and then Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Come visit with us. We hope to see you there. And as the church continues to grow, people are driving miles to hear the truth. Yes, I drove an hour to get here, but it's worth it, and we try to do it every week. I think we've definitely developed a reputation here. I think folks know who we are. Uh, they're familiar with what we teach. Um, <clears throat> I think there's still a lot of territory to be covered. I think things are going wonderful. Right. And I really think that Johnny is one of the best preachers I ever heard in my life. And he's got two sons that are going to follow in his steps. So I wouldn't want to be anywhere but here. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. I despise, hate, detest, and loathe the Church of Christ and everything about it. I, I hate them. I really do. The better I get to know them, the more I hate them. I, I want to rid the world of the Churches of Christ. See why the atheists don't like the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services are 11 a.m. and Wednesday at 7 p.m. at 823 Starling Avenue. Watch them on TV in Martinsville at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and on Sunday on WGSR. In the Church of Christ, we teach that the Bible teaches that we can intermarry and we therefore we will intermingle we'll also have a very diverse future. When I first heard about the Church of Christ and what they were teaching, they made me believe that they were actually teaching the truth. And if you're teaching the truth, there should not be an issue with black or white. So I decided to visit here, and that's when I realized that they are teaching the truth and black or white, regardless of what your nationality is, is not an issue. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. Don't flex your muscles. Flex your mind. Watch a word from the Lord Thursday nights at 9. I did for science. What power? What power? After losing the debate to the KKK, Michael went to school. Just being a preacher in general is not a job for sissies. Uh, you have to have thick skin. You have to be ready to be uh, scrutinized on all points. Uh, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I believe that they were really trying to help us with, you know, in the school that I was attending, was that some of the instructors, they would, you know, they would kind of pick out some guys and they would just be really hard on them for a certain amount of time. Visit the Martinsville Church of Christ. Services 11 a.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Watch them on TV Wednesday night at 9 p.m. on Comcast Channel 18 and Sunday night on WGSR at 9 p.m. Real Local, WGSR 47.1, in high definition. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James Ofer here with you, and it's good to be back, and I appreciate Mark and Micah uh, doing the, the programs for me as, uh, as I was out of town and, and gone for a while. I'm trying to get back in the groove and, and get used to uh, uh, doing things again, but we are still meeting at 250 the Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina. We hope you'll come out and visit with us. We have Bible studies on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock, and we worship at uh, Sundays. We have class at 9 and worship at 10, so we hope that you will come out and be with us and uh, uh, join us anytime you can. Uh, Mark, can you come turn this TV down? Is this? Um, but we, uh, we want you to know that we'd like to, to hear from you. Study the Bible with us at wordofthelord.gmail.com if you'd like to... That one right there? 
I don't think that one. I don't think that's it. So uh, uh, we'd like for you to come out and visit with us and study God's Word with us. If you are in the Martinsville area, eight twenty three Starling Avenue is where we are. Is where we are. The Saints meet there. Uh, Mike is there. I don't have his number up here. Uh, Johnny's number is there. Uh, Mark is in Danville, one twenty American Legion, and uh, there's brethren there. They're studying the Bible on Tuesday nights, and uh, I think Brother Jim Brewer has been uh, teaching on Tuesday nights. So we got brethren that are filling in different places. So you may not uh, uh, see who you expect to see teaching wherever you go to one of these places, but you'll always know that what they're teaching is the Bible. So <clears throat> that is that is the, the the surety that you will get. So we hope that you will come out and study God's Word with us, and and uh, let us hear from you. Let us. Let us see you, get to know you, and uh, and make your acquaintance. What does the Bible say? Come on Tuesday nights at 9 p.m. WHIG TV. Uh, that's out of Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. So we want you to take advantage of that as well. And want to say uh, hello to all of those who are watching in, uh, on the internet and uh, those out in the, the the far regions away from here. <clears throat> I know people are watching on a regular basis out in Texas, Oklahoma, and. And other places, Arkansas, and and uh, even other parts of North Carolina, outside of our viewing area, they're watching online. Appreciate your uh, your diligence and your support and your and your encouragement that we get. We get emails and and things from that people who are watching that we you know never met. We want to meet, but uh, nonetheless, we appreciate your uh, your input and, and hearing from you because that that is really a source of encouragement to us. Whereas a lot of people would want, would want to see us decline and diminish and and kind of go the way of the dinosaur and just dry out and blow away. But we're still here, and we are uh, trying to do more and more and going to uh, uh, further into the world and let the, our sound go out into all the all the world, as, as the Bible says in Romans 10, 13. So we hope that you will uh, continue to watch and, and tell others about our program. You know, we have in our society, we have individuals that are, uh, part of a generation, uh, the 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 lost generation was the the caption or the heading that was given to individuals that fought primarily in uh, World War One, uh, early eighteen in the early nineteen hundreds, uh, the generation of nineteen fourteen. They were the lost generation. We have we call generations by names like the greatest generation was was uh, given to the. Uh, uh, the uh, the generation that fought in World War II, and around uh, uh, 1916 is when they were they were born. From 1916 to the mid 20s, the greatest generation. We have uh, individuals that are called the generation of the uh, the 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 baby boom generation that were born following World War, World War II, and uh, they came up when a time when there was. You know, people coming back from war, and there was just a boom in in, uh, in, in babies being born. And Generation X, uh, the generation that uh, was born after the baby boom ended, these are the the baby busters, you might say. The more recent generation, I guess, the younger generation today is Generation Y, and then you have the millennials and and so forth. And each generation has its own uh, things that it's known for, you might say. Each generation has its own characteristics, things that it that uh, uh, are identified by, you might say. And so, what we want to talk about tonight is really what generation are you from? You know, the Bible talks about different generations, and I submit to you that it doesn't really matter how old you are, you may be a part of one of these generations. And the reason we're talking about these different generations, friends, is because of what the Bible does say about them and about the characteristics that define this particular generation, these particular generations. I want you to realize that our goal as members of the Church of Christ, as we're preaching the gospel, is to help people realize that the gospel is what's going to help our society. I know in the past we've, we've done a number of, of TV programs and discussed the, the ramifications or the, the consequences of, of, an, of an humanist, atheistic world and what that would be like if there was a godless society, if everybody did their own thing. And this is really what we're talking about. This is kind of more of the same. This is the, the generation, what the generation would be like if there is no standard that we all must adhere to. Now listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 30, Proverbs chapter 30, 
And I'm going to pull my, get my uh, scriptures up here so we can read uh, this together. But the Bible says that there is a generation that does certain things that are characterized in in certain way. And that's what we want to see if you're a, if you're a part of that generation. Proverbs 11, uh, 30 and verse 11. Proverbs 30, verse 11. There is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. Let's talk about this generation for a moment. There's a generation that curses their father and does not bless their mother. You know, we, uh, I think more and more, we're living in a, in a time where this could be a characteristic of the generation in which we live. A generation in which older people are not really appreciated or respected or looked at as being a value. The older generation really is one of our most valuable resources. I think if you had to, um, uh, if, you, if you had to stop and, and, and ask someone about what some of the, the better uh, ways to live or some things that we may have to, uh, I'm going to change my setting right here just for a moment, and uh, how, how to do things, the older generation is that generation. It is the generation that, uh, uh, that knows more than most people have. Uh, they forgot more than most people know, you might say. I've always said that if, you know, if it came down to having to go, go back and grow our own foods and have our own uh, uh, victory gardens and things like that, uh, I would go live uh, next to uh, one of our older members because he knows how to garden. He knows when to plant. He knows, you know, what, what to do. And so that's, that, that's what I'm saying about it. They, they know how to, how to survive because they grew up in that generation. But more and more, people don't respect that generation or they don't have any use for that generation. And they think that it's, you know, that, well, you, you're, you're no longer profitable, therefore we'll, we'll kick you out. But listen, God has always said that people should take care of and respect the older generation. Proverbs 19 and verse 32, and uh, I don't know what I've done to my, I might have to get the kinks worked out, being on the road of kind of, Got my computer out of whack a little bit, but I guess we're going to look at uh, Leviticus 19 and verse 32. Listen to what God has said. This is way back in, under the law of Moses even. The idea that you ought to respect your elders. He said, thou shalt rise up before the hoary head, the gray hair, and honor the face of the old man, and fear thy God, I am the Lord. And so God has always in, intended that people have a, a proper respect for the aged, aged people, we tell, our, we, we tell our, our children all the time that you need to respect, you need to respect the older, your older generation, respect your elders. And, and so that's really what we're, we're, we're trying to deal with, is the idea that these people are, are, are individuals you should respect, not just look down upon. But more and more, our generation looks at this as, as something, you know what? This is really not somebody we, we, we have a value for. They don't have any intrinsic value anymore. Their usefulness is gone. And we relegate, relegate them over here to the, you know, to the, uh, uh, the nursing home, the assisted livings. We kind of put them, out of, put them out of our sight because they're not convenient anymore. That's wrong, friends. That, that's, that's, that's wrong. We're living, that's, that means we're part of that generation that really doesn't honor and respect our, our, uh, our older uh, uh, citizens. And so... Jesus talked about this in Mark chapter 9, 7, verses 9 through 12. Mark 7, 9 through 12. Notice the idea that individuals were trying to excuse themselves from, their, from, from, uh, from dealing with an older generation. He says, He said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Now, what was their tradition they were trying to keep? He said unto them, For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother. And whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. And then he said, but ye say, ye say, now Moses said honor, and if you curse your father or mother, let him die the death. But, but ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it's Corban, that is to say a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be, be profited, then uh, he shall be free. In other words, the Jews had this idea, said, well, if you tell your parents, well, you know what, really I gave it all to the Lord. I gave it as a gift to God. I did it uh, as, as a gift. Then you're free from keeping the law of God that said honor your father and mother. But see, friends, this is the problem that people have today is they think that God wants 
uh, sacrifice, that he wants, he wants certain things that they can give him when really what he wants is obedience. In 1 Samuel 15 and verse 22, Saul was told that what God wanted, what God delighted in was obedience, not the fat of rams. He didn't delight in the, the uh, burnt offerings and things like that. What he really delighted in was obedience. And so that's the key. But when individuals try to relegate or they try to justify disobeying God and, and say, well, you know, I've given to God over here, therefore I can disobey God over here, that's showing that they're part of this generation that really despises God and despises what he said about uh, this older generation. Notice this. Uh, in Mark 7, in verse 12, Jesus said, Ye suffer him uh, no more to do aught for his father or his mother. So you basically say, well, this person get a pass for doing nothing for his father or mother. And you know, if you, uh, if you take the time sometime just to go through uh, some of these nursing homes and assisted livings, uh, it should make you shudder to realize that this is where a lot of times where people go because they're, it's not convenient. Now, I'm not saying that it's, if a person has, um, has their parents in, in, a, in a nursing home or sitting living that they're wrong, but I'm just saying if it is for the purpose of just getting them out of, out of my hair, out, out, of my, out of my way, you know, it's not convenient to take care of them. That's what I'm talking about, friends. I'm talking about the idea that we are not going to uh, suffer ourselves. We're not going to be able to sacrifice some of ourselves to care for someone who's elderly because, because they're elderly. When I was growing up, uh, as I was in high school and on into college, my grandmother actually was living with us. She died at, she died in my home, uh, the home where I grew up. And uh, it was because, you know, we were going to take care of her. You know, my mom was, was there, and she was taking care of my grandmother to the day she died. And so because it was, it was this idea that, you know what, she's special, she's important, even though she's elderly, even though she's, you know, not uh, totally in her mind, even though she's had strokes and she can't, you know, she can't think clearly, she'd get up and she would, she'd be sitting in the in the in the, uh, the easy chair and she'd be all dressed up and we'd say, Grandmother, where you know where we're going? She goes, Well, we're getting ready to go to church. And we say, Well, Grandmother, it's Tuesday, you know, and so she didn't know where she was. But but here, you know, we weren't going to say, Well, well, she doesn't know where she is anyway. We'll just put her over in the corner. No. That, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about an appreciation and respect for life. And that's what God has always said. In Exodus 12, 20 and verse 12, Exodus 20 and verse 12, listen to what uh, God says. He said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and thy days may be long upon the earth, on the land which the Lord thy God shall give thee. Uh, and so it is the idea that this is a, a part, this is going to, what is going to help you uh, to stay a long time on the land, keep this possession is if you're actually showing the proper respect that you should have to your elderly people. Because what happens, friends, when society starts delegating that one group of people is no longer valuable, then you start losing the, the inherent uh, belief or the, the inherent uh, idea that, well, life is valuable. And so life starts being meaningless. And so th that's what I'm saying. Our society is going to decline. If people start saying, well, this group of people is too young, they can't do anything, we'll kill them. Or this people is too old, we can't do anything, we'll, we'll put them out of their misery. You know, and so you have people saying, well, when, 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 when grandmother gets old, when your mother gets old, or grandmother gets old, or grandpa gets old, instead of, uh, you know, giving them treatment that's available, well, just take a pill over here and let them die. Well, that's, that's not right. That's the generation that we're talking about here. The generation that says, you know what? Older people just aren't worth it. No, they're, they're worth it. They're worth it. And so you may not think, well, I'm not going to curse my, my parents, but you know what? Honoring goes beyond words. Honoring goes beyond words. In 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 3, listen to what, what the Bible says. Honor widows that are widows indeed. I mean, the Bible actually gives instructions for individuals who are widows indeed, and there's qualifications there. If a, if a widow has children or nephews or individuals that are, uh, uh, that are able, then they're supposed to take care of them. He says, if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn 
uh, first to show piety at home and to requite their parents for that, notice, for that is uh, good and acceptable before God. And so it is a, it is a, a prerequisite that if you have members of your family that need to be cared for, they should be your responsibility. Don't pawn them off over here on the rest of society. Don't pawn them off on the church. You know, it's your responsibility. But yet too many times, that's the kind of uh, attitude we have in our society is, I don't want the responsibility. And so society comes up and we become part of a generation that says, I'm not going to do what I should do. Now, friends, you look around and just let's be honest with ourselves. Do you not see that attitude in our society where people say, well, it's not, I don't want to do it. I don't want the responsibility. It may be my responsibility, but I don't want it, so I'm not going to take it. And so that's where we are. That's where we are. And so responsibility or this, this honoring goes, goes far beyond just words. Notice this one, uh, uh, one lawyer actually said, now, it's, it's a sad commentary that it even has to be suggested that this is what happened. But one, one lawyer is saying children should be forced to care for parents and grandparents to repay them for free child care. Now, I'm not for legislation that makes people do things. I think if you, if you convince them, you change their heart and their mind, their attitude about things, that's the better way to do it because you, you, know, you just can't force people to do something. But if you, but if you can convince them that this is the right thing to do, then that's all, all the better. But just the idea that someone has to come up and say, I think we ought to make a law that makes people care for their parents and their grandparents to repay them for what parents and grandparents have done for them, you know, that's a sad commentary on our society. That's a sad commentary on our society. Now, I would think that most, most parents and grandparents would... would uh, uh, I'd hope would want to want to be around for the, to their uh, for their grandchildren at least to some degree, but not to pawn them off and say, "Well, you know what?" For a child to say, "Well, I've got kids, I've got children, I brought children to this world. I'm not gonna care for them. I'm gonna pawn them off onto my mother and my father." That's where that's where society breaks down. And believe me, I know individuals who are like that. That they bring children to the world, three or four, five, six kids, and then they say, "Well, you know what?" I'm going to do my own thing. I'm still going to live a wild life, and I'll let my grandparents, I'll let my, my mom and dad take care of them. That's a sorry dog that will do that. That's a sorry individual that will not assume responsibility and doesn't have really the proper respect for the, the elderly, in this case his mother and father, than to say, you know what? You, you've, you've raised your kids, now I'll raise mine. Oh, no. No, 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 no. I'm going to leave my children with their grandparents for a day, maybe a night, let them spend a night a couple times, but uh, a couple days, but you know what? They're not going to raise my children. That's my responsibility. And so the, there, there's a generation that comes up and says, well, I'm not going to respect, I'm not going to respect my parents enough. Well, that day's coming then. That day's coming. You know, we joke about it. Here's a cartoon. Uh, the little boy's told to, you know, go clean his room. And he says, okay, I'll go tidy my room. But you'll regret this. In 40 years, you need to be afraid. Be very afraid. Because in 40 years, I'm going to be taking care of you. See, that's a lack of respect that is being shown. Now, is this the generation we live in? Look around, friends. You know, you may be, somewhat, you may be in the greatest generation, the baby boomer generation, the baby buster generation. You may be in millennial uh, generation X, generation millennium, X, Y, Z, whatever. But look around, I submit to you that that's the society, that's the generation that we're living in where more and more people have no respect for, for, uh, for the elderly or for the, the older people in our society. They're relegated to a, a, a place where, you know what, we'll just, put, we'll just put them out of their misery. If you don't think that's coming, friends, there's some, there some countries that do that. The Netherlands, I think maybe Sweden does that, euthanasia. You get to a certain age, you get, you're unprofitable. Well, the best thing for you to do is just go die. You're using up valuable resources. How sad, how sad of a commentary that is on society. But there's a generation that does that, that, that despises their, their fathers and mothers. 
But there's another generation. Notice this. In Proverbs, <clears throat> uh, Proverbs uh, uh, chapter, let's look at this. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 14. Proverbs 30 and verse 14. You can go ahead and put the phone lines up uh, if you want to, Richard. Uh, Proverbs 30, verse 14. There's a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy uh, from among men. There's a generation that would just consume. You know, their, 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 their teeth are swords, jaws are, are, are knives, and their whole goal is just to devour the poor. Now, they're not really talking about literally eating these individuals, but the idea that you are not caring for the individuals that are poor, that are in need, and they will take advantage to to uh, uh, to uh, or take advantage of those individuals. Jesus said in Matthew chapter twenty-six in verse eleven, He says, "For the poor you have with you always." But there's a generation that doesn't really care for those who cannot provide. For themselves. And notice I said who cannot provide for themselves. If you're capable of providing for yourselves, the Bible says if you don't eat, you should if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. And it ought to be the case that when we're uh, when our society is actually encouraging people to not work, to stay at home, and we're, we're they're actually getting paid longer and longer periods of time to stay at home, draw draw uh, uh, unemployment. And then not even have to find a job, friends. What we're doing is we're actually putting individuals in a position to where they will be taken advantage of, where they will be uh, devoured, if you will, because we're not we're not uh, encouraging them to to fend for themselves. But look at this. Look at this. A generation that wants to devour the poor, that wants to devour the needy, that has no no respect. They're ruthless, really, in their practice. It's what we're talking about here. Now, so what's condemned is taking advantage of these individuals who, who cannot uh, uh, care for themselves. Look at Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22 and verse 16. He that oppresseth the poor to increase his riches, and he that giveth to the rich shall surely come to want. Now, we live in a, we live in a society, generation today, where people say, well, you know, the haves and the have-nots. There's nothing wrong with having, friends. There's nothing wrong with someone working hard and, and making money. You know, we're getting to the point now where profit is a bad word. You know, when you have some of these Hollywood elite types that are saying, well, you know, profit is a bad word. Profit's a bad word. No, profit's a good word. But the problem is when people aren't taught how to use their money properly, that is when you have problems. That's when they start, that's when greed takes over and actually corrupts individuals. But there's nothing wrong with working hard and earning a living and making money and, and, uh, and getting something uh, out of life. That is, that is a biblical principle. But what you ought to recognize too is the Bible also says that one reason why you work is so that you have to give to some, some others. Notice this in, in Ephesians, let's say I believe it's Ephesians 4 in verse 28. Uh, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hand the thing which is good. Why? That he may have to give to him that needeth. You know, there's a lot of individuals that are actually blessed because people who have a lot of money actually give away that money. They actually donate it. But I find it interesting that a lot of people who have a lot of money want to turn around and tell other people who have less money, what they should do with their money. You know, this is what you need to be doing. Well, look, put your money where your mouth is. And so we live in a society then where most people look at, at the rich and say, well, they're just greedy. Well, there's nothing wrong with working friends. There's nothing wrong with making money and being success because that in turn can help, can let your person help someone else. But the problem is, is when that, when, when that uh, runs amok, when that, when that uh, uh, problem gets out of hand, you're on the word from the Lord. Good evening, Brother James. This is Juanita. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing great. It's so good to see you back. We sure have missed you. Well, 
I, I appreciate that. I, I missed I missed being here. I can I can assure you that. Well, this I, this is you may not remember me, but I'm one of them. You always ask Jack Harris when you see him. You always ask him about me. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, and All I right. want to tell you, you're really preaching a good sermon tonight. Well, thank you. And I want to get I want to give a good Lord of praise, James, while I'm talking to you. Last Wednesday, they told us that my granddaughter wouldn't make it through the night, but thank God, God touched her, and she's doing fine. Well, I'm glad she's okay. I'm glad she's okay. Uh, well, when, when are we going right, we'll we'll to get to see you again? Um, I'm trying to figure out how to get to your church. I'll call you back sometime okay. uh, on your well, own. I don't have a church, you know, but we, we, meet, we meet on the boulevard, 250 the boulevard. It's not that hard to find. Okay, huh? Okay. All right, we'll All talk right. to Thank, you later, Paul Jay. All right. Okay. Well, that's encouraging. Glad, glad, glad I was missed. Sometimes I think sometimes people I say that's probably a happy miss. You know, they were happy that I was gone, but <clears throat> nonetheless. So, what kind of gener what generation are we living in here? Are we living in a generation that is actually taking advantage of people? Look, everybody knows our, about Bernie Madoff. We've heard about Bernie Madoff. Uh, a few years ago, you know, took advantage of individuals. He actually took advantage of the rich people. He actually took advantage of rich people and took their money and, their, and schemed them. But what about individuals that actually cheat the poor? What about individuals that actually set it up to where the poor are the ones who are being abused and mistreated? Now, Jesus talked about those kind of people. In Matthew 23 and verse 14, Matthew 23 and verse 14, look what he says. He said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers that you may, uh, uh, that you may, uh, for a pretense make long, for, long prayers, therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Devour widows' houses. How, how does a person, how would a person devour widows' house? How about making it so that the individual, like the widow, who's living on a very limited, fixed income, is told that, you know what, you've got to pay your tithes. Wouldn't that be devouring widow's house? Wouldn't that be taking advantage of the poor or mistreating the poor? You know, I, I know individuals that, that have, uh, you have, you have a widow lady who's living, living in a house, paying a rent, and then they would go up on a rent. Because they say, well, we can't afford the taxes. You want that's, that's a shame. That's a sin. Because it's the idea that, you know what, well, we can't do it. You mean to tell me that because your taxes, you can't, you can't seem to pay your taxes, that you're going to take it out of the widow's pocket? Now, friends, this is what Jesus is talking about. There's a generation that wants to devour or actually takes advantage of the poor and the needy, the ones who need it the most that should be getting the help are the ones that are being used to uh, 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 by others to get rich. So these people seek riches, they seek honor, they seek glory at the expense of others. Look at this, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 8. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 8. Paul said, having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich, and I notice this, they will be rich. It's, it's their desire, their goal to be rich, fall into temptation and a snare. Now again, it's not a sin to be rich. It's not a sin to make money. But the danger is when that becomes your goal and your desire, then it's easy to fall into a snare. And he says, and many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men which drown uh, men in destruction and perdition. Well, what about this, Paul? What about verse 10? He says, For the love of money is the root of all evil. It's not the love of money. Uh, or is money not the root of all evil? It's the love of money that's the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, so they covet after, they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Individuals that have this desire to say, you know what, I'm going to get ahead on the backs of others. That's where the problem comes in. 
But you know what, there, friends? There are plenty of individuals that I know that have a lot more money than I do. And they are very, very generous with it. And that's, that's the kind of individuals that are in control of their money. They're the master of what God has blessed them with. They haven't become the servant to it. And so, uh, uh, you know, that's what we're talking about. But individuals who said, you know what, I'm, I've got money, I'm going to get more, and I'm going to do it at the expense of others, that's the problem. Notice this. In Acts 4 and verse 32, Acts 4 and verse 32 is a good, uh, there's a good example of individuals who have a problem with money. Now, the first person we look at, his name is Joseph, or Barnabas is what they call him. The multitude of them that believed were of one heart, one soul, neither said any of them that had all of the things, all of the things which they had uh, possessed were his own. What were they doing? They were, they were giving it, uh, but, they had the, uh, uh, but they had all things uh, common. Verse 33, uh, verse 34, Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands and houses sold them, and brought the prices of the things that were uh, sold, brought them and laid them at, down at the apostles' feet. And, and distribu distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. So if someone was destitute, they were provided for. If they couldn't provide for their own selves, they were provided for. But individuals who could provide for themselves, do you think that they were helped out? No, you get out and get to work. Get, get to work. Sometimes people come by, they come by our building, come knock on the door and say, you know what, I, I need some money, I need some gas money to get to Greensboro. Smell like a brewery. Smell like a brewery and, and, and cigarette factory. Listen, if you got money for, for alcohol and tobacco, you've got more money than I do. If you quit smoking and quit drinking and quit gambling, you know what, you might have some money for gas. See what I'm talking about? So you get yourself in control here. I'm not going to help you. I'm not going to help you so that then you can turn around and say, "Well, you know what? Now I don't have to spend money on gas. I go spend more money on alcohol and cigarettes." No, don't ask me for help. I'm, I'm going to be a better steward steward of the money that I have that God's blessed me with than to help you, you know, in this problem. But notice this: there was a man named Joseph Barnabas. Is what they called him. He sold some land and brought it and laid it down to apostles' feet. Now that was a good thing. But notice, in the next chapter, chapter 5, we meet people who don't have that same attitude. We meet Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias is a man, his wife, Sapphira, sold a uh, possession and kept back part of the price, his wife being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, that wasn't a problem, but here's the problem. They actually were lying about what they were bringing and how much they were bringing. They're saying, we sold a piece of land, and we're bringing all of it to you. No, no, they really didn't. They really didn't. Now, they didn't have to bring it all. They could have given just a little bit of it. They could have given as much as they wanted to give. But the problem was they were lying about it to be seen of others. Uh, Peter said unto Ananias, Why has Satan uh, filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and keep back part of the price of the land? While it was... Was it remained, was it not thine own, and after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? And hast thou, why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but hast lied unto God. Now, what were they trying to do? They were trying to make themselves be something. It was that love of money, that desire, that desire for power and prestige and honor and glory, that's what got, brought them to their downfall. And so there's a generation that wants that. There's a generation that says, you know what, we need to, we need to uh, uh, get ahead. We need some prestige, some honor, some money, and the way we're going to do it is take advantage of other people. No, friends. That's not what the Bible's teaching. If we want our society to be better, we're going to have to be a better generation than this. But you know where our society is? Our society is actually going the other way. Our society is actually the one that's taking advantage of the poor. Think about this. What about state lotteries? What about state lottery? You know, in North Carolina, North Carolina lottery, I think, came in in 2005. And in the 20 poorest counties in North Carolina, 18 of them lot had lottery sales topping the statewide average 
of $200 per adult. In Lenore County, for instance, where nearly one in every four residents is below the poverty line, one in every four, 25% is under the poverty line. The average uh, uh, sale of lottery per adult was $423.92. $423.424. In one of the poorest counties in North Carolina to spend on the lottery, what do you think they're doing? They're trying to get something for nothing, one, one thing, which makes gambling wrong. But see what the lottery does? The lottery actually takes advantage of the poor people because the poor people are trying to get ahead. See that? I've driven through Oklahoma. I've driven through Oklahoma. You go through the Choctaw Nation, and our government has, has you know, allowed the, 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 the Native Americans to build these big casinos. Nothing out there. Nothing out there. I'm talking about just, just poor, poor little towns where you drive through. And all of a sudden, boom, great big old casino out in the middle of nowhere. It's not helping. That's not helping the Native Americans. It's helping some. The ones who are making the money off the ones who are coming and paying the money. But it's it's not helping society at all. It's not benefiting them. And yet, we live in a generation that says, hey, you know, if we're going to make some money, we're going to make some revenue. You know, we've got to keep people from going up here to Virginia to buy a lottery tickets. We've got people from going to South Carolina to buy a lottery tickets. We need to have our own lottery. No, you don't. Because all you're doing is you're hurting more of your society, hurting more of the population, and it's the poor people that is really hurting. Now, you mean to tell me that the state lottery is actually helping society? So there's a generation that really doesn't care about the poor and the needy and those who cannot help themselves or those who are in, in distress. That's where our society is, friend. You mean to tell me that, that that's, that's a good thing? You know, I want you to think about, let's go a little bit outside of our area. Let's go into the world. There's a generation that really that really doesn't care about the helpless. And when I'm talking about the helpless, I'm talking about infants. You know, when you hear things, what I'm fixing to show you, I, I hope it makes you cringe or shudder. It may not. Maybe you may be so callous that it doesn't bother you at all. But do you realize that in China, you know, China has a one-child policy rule. But do you realize that in China, women actually have to have a little book like this, like you see. Now, this kind of looks like a, a visa, a passport, but you know what it actually is? It's actually a booklet, and it's like a birth permit card. You have, women, when they start and, and this may be a little, I'm not trying to be coarse here, but in China, when women start menstruating, they have to go and register. And they have to have the government verify, sanction, whatever, keep up with every time they cycle and are they on birth control. And you cannot become pregnant unless you have a permit from the government that tells you when you are allowed to conceive. Do you think about that? And we say, well, you know, that, that's, that's pretty oppressive. Yeah, it is. And because if you do conceive, if you do have a child, an unborn child, I know the humanist atheist doesn't like that, but nonetheless, that's what it is, they kill them. They kill them. You know, there's forced... Uh, uh, forced uh, 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 abortion. So if you if you get away from your documents, you know, then you're going to be in trouble. Between fifteen thousand and twenty five thousand babies are forcefully aborted every day in China. They actually have a full time planning officials, state planning officials, full time. Their job is to look for individuals women who are pregnant and let's see if you if you got your papers to be pregnant and if you don't then what they do is they put them into the 
the slaughter beds, they call them, in the hospital. And that's where these children are boarded. Now, friend, you know, you think, man, that, that's terrible. That's terrible. Taking advantage of uh, or, or, you know, killing all these unborn children. China, you know, China's terrible. You know, they, they got terrible human rights policy. We, we do the same thing in the United States. Only difference is the government doesn't tell us that we have to have an abortion. Or, or do they? You know? When the government starts mandating what happens with your health care, friends, that is pretty much going to dictate everything of your life. And so what that then, done, what that then comes down to is how are you going to treat the innocent, the unborn? How are you going to take care of them? What are you going to do with them? Well, they're, they're inconvenient. So it's kind of like the, the older generation. Now we've got the younger generation, the unborn. Well, let's, let's take care of them. Let's euthanize them, you know? And so are we, are we becoming that generation? Are we becoming that generation that, you know, doesn't, uh, doesn't care? Are we becoming that generation that has become so, so corrupt that we just will take advantage of anything to make a dollar? If you don't think that the abortion industry is about making money, think again, friends. That's what it's all about. It's about power and control, and it does it by taking advantage of the lower people in society. You think about it. People under the poverty level are on the lower end of the, of the, of the economic scale are the ones who are more affected by the birth of a child. And therefore, the abortionist comes in and says, hey, we can alleviate some of this problem. Well, why, why instead of taking the baby, why don't we help them get a job provided for that baby, teach them to provide for the baby? Or how about better yet, how about, we, how about we teach them to have a family unit and we teach the father of the child, you have responsibility to take care of that child and keep the family unit intact. But instead what we do is we actually reward our society. In our society we reward individuals for living Outside of marriage, we reward them for having children, and then we pay for them to kill their own children if they choose so. It's totally backward, friend. Totally backward. We're becoming that generation. We are that generation. We're trying to change it. We're trying to turn that generation around. And so there's a generation. There's a generation that that knives have knives and for teeth and devour the needy and the poor. And that's the society we live in today. Let's look at one more. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 11. There's a generation that curses father and mother. There's a generation, verse 12, there's a generation that's pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. Verse 13. There's a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. They're conceited, they're lofty, they're, well, they're, they're, the, they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. Pure in their own eyes. Nothing, nothing, is, nothing is, is impure to this society, to this generation. This generation says, well, you know, anything goes, and, and, and what I want to do is, it's, you know, that's my prerogative. There's no purity. There's no regard for what's right or wrong. Actually, you know, everybody doing their own thing is the standard. That's what we're told. The atheist, the humanist says, subjective standard is, is the best standard. You do what, you, you know, if it makes you feel good, that's, if it brings pleasure, that's good. To this generation. And that's what I'm saying. This generation is not relegated to a certain age group. It's a group of people who would practice this. So there's a generation that does not see themselves really as they really are seen by God or individuals who are looking at society through a moral standard. Notice Proverbs 21, verse verse 2. Proverbs 21, verse 2. 
Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. But the Lord pondereth the hearts. Every way of man is right in his own eyes. But the Lord pondereth the heart. You know, when individuals look out and say, hey, this, this is what I want to do, it's got to be right. There's no, there's no regard for right or wrong. To a group of, to a, to a generation that says, I'm going to do what I want to do. There's no regard for right or wrong. To an individual that says, well, what, what is moral? What is immoral? You know, modesty's out the door. You know, people run around naked, and that's fine. With, with society. They get, they get drunk, they get stoned, they get high. Oh, that's fine. You think about this, friends. Our society is not concerned about purity. It's not, concern, it's not concerned about morality. For example, in the state of Colorado, legalized marijuana. It's legalizing marijuana. Now, if you don't think that's going to be a problem, friends, just think about it. Do you know what the, the, uh, what the reason most students in Colorado are expelled from school for you? For possession of marijuana? See, when you legalize something, when you legalize a drug or you legalize any kind of immoral activity, you know what happens? You actually make it more accessible to people and more people are going to partake of it. And when more people partake of it, guess what happens? You have society that's going to go further and further down the drain. You can't say, well, it's, you know, we're going to regulate it. If you legalize prostitution, you legalize cocaine, or you legalize whatever you want to legalize and say, well, now it's, now it's legal. All that does is make it more accessible for people. And it hurts society. But there's a society that says, you know what? So what? You know, everything's good. Everything's good in our eyes. We're, we're good with it. We can do what we want to do. Uh, they're just, they're, they're no, not, not really concerned about how people view them, really. And if they are, you know, if they are, uh, if, if, if it's not a favorable impression, they don't care. I mean, think about it. We have right here in Reedsville, right here outside of town, got a nudist colony. I guess it's still, I guess still operating. I guess it's probably not operating this time of the year, but uh, but that's where we live. Look at this in uh, in Luke sixteen verse fifteen. This is the society we live in. Individuals that want to justify themselves, but they're not really concerned about being justified with God. Luke sixteen fifteen. He said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts, for he which is lightly, for, for, for that which is lightly esteemed, highly esteemed among men, is an abomination in the sight of God. We live in a society that says, hey, let's do what we want to do. Let's feel good. You know, let's promote it. Let's, if it feels good, let's, hey, let's do it. Let's make people want to do the immoral and the ungodly things. Friends, it's not going to help society at all. Uh, Titus 1, verse 15. Titus 1, verse 15. Notice this. Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind, notice, even their mind and conscience is defiled. This is the people, this is the people that when you say something, you know, they always see the the dirty side of it. Oh, that was that was dirty. What do, what do you mean? You know? Anytime you say something, or they see something, their mind automatically goes to the to the dirty side, you know, the, the gutter, if you will. That's what, what we're talking about here. But to the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled, nothing is pure. Everything is only on evil continually. And our society is promoting that. Our society promotes that. You don't think our society, friend, listen, here's where our society is going. Our society is actually encouraging people to, to be more promiscuous in their lifestyle, to be more uh, uninhibited 
in their lifestyle. If you don't believe that, just look at some of these ads for, for insurance, the, the uh, Affordable Care Act. These are ads. These are actual ads that are running to encourage people to get government insurance. Now, how is this going to help society? This is, this is not a political statement, friends. This is just a moral statement. But look at this. This ad, now you have a tough time reading this, but here's these, these four women, five women, and they've got a ski. It's like a, a snow ski. And in front of each one of them is a shot of, I guess, whiskey. And the caption says, the top left-hand corner says, shot skis keep us happy. Flu shots keep us healthy. Saving money on flu shots leaves us more money for fun shots. We got insurance. Now, you can too. And at the bottom it says, thanks, Obamacare. Friends, is that really going to help our insurance? Is that really going to help society? To encourage people to go out and get drunk? Well, look at this one. Here's another one. Here's a guy doing keg stands. He's upside down on a keg, you know, guzzling beer, he and his buddies. And again, it says, it says, bro insurance, all right? Insurance for your, for your brothers, I guess. You know, your, 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 frat, your frat buddies. And it says, keg stands are crazy, but not having health insurance is, cra is, is crazier. Don't trip, uh, don't dip into your beer money. Uh, don't dip into your beer money to cover the, uh, uh, I can't read that, you know. Get, get covered. Get some insurance. Get some, get some insurance so that you can be more reckless in your lifestyle. Really, friends? Is that really going to help society? That's just what we need is we need more college students out here getting drunk. Yeah, yeah. Go America. That's really going to help our society. Now, friends, anybody who buys car insurance knows that the more drunk drivers you have on the road, the higher your premiums go up, insurance rates go up. The more people that are actually uh, filing insurance claims makes the cost go up. It's just basic economy. This is not helping society. But my point is our society is actually encouraging people to be more uh, promiscuous, to be more reckless, to be more uninhibited in their lifestyle. That's not helping society, friends. That's just not helping society. Here's one more. Here's one more. Here's a girl. She's got her birth control pills. And it says, Oh, he's hot. Let's get physical. Boy, he's hot. I, let's hope he's as easy to get, uh, that he's as easy to get as this birth control. My health insurance covers the pill, which means all I have to do is worry about getting him between the covers. Seriously? Oh yeah, this is going to help our society. Friends, this is where our society is. Nothing is pure except what they think is pure. Oh, there's nothing wrong with that. Oh yeah, that, that's great stuff. That's great stuff. Let's, you know, let's, let's make, uh, let's give away free birth control so that we can encourage people to be more promiscuous in their lifestyle. Friends, you see what we're talking about? We're getting away from Bible principles. And the only thing that happens is, and the only thing that happens is people become more and more looser in their morals, ungodly in their actions, and society suffers. Well, let me tell you something. Individuals who are thinking this way, they're puffed up. They're puffed up like the old peacock strutting around uh, the peacock. But friends, you can strut like a peacock, but in the end, God's going to pluck your feathers. And being that generation that doesn't care about the elderly, doesn't care about the poor or the needy, or that doesn't see anything wrong with the ungodly lifestyle you're living, that's not helping our society. That's just making it worse. It's making it worse. Friends, I hope you realize that the church of Christ in your area is trying to better our society by giving you Bible principles like this. I want to say I, it's good to be back. hope it's been beneficial. But I can assist you in any way. I want to do that very thing. 
uh, I'm out of time. So until next time, friends, remember to uh, come see us over on the boulevard. And if I can assist you in any way in obeying the gospel, I want to do that very thing. Until next time, remember to ask, what does the Bible say? And you always get a word from the Lord. Have a good night. I'm Mark Childry. Glad to have you here. Coming to you from our studios in beautiful downtown Reedsville, North Carolina, on this 14th day of November 2013. This month is moving along very quickly, and before you know it, Thanksgiving will be here. The Reedsville Christmas Parade will be here, too. We'll talk more about that coming up in just a little bit and what will happen on the night before the Reedsville Christmas Parade. We're trying to get you in the Christmas spirit and the holiday spirit, and so we'll have more up in just a little bit. We've got 54 degrees at our studios in downtown Reedsville this hour, and Star News on Matt Smith is standing by to give us a look at the forecast. After all, just one more work day, and then the weekend will be here. Don't forget it's Thursday, and that means it's Rockingham County United Way Day. And Debbie Moore is here, and she'll be talking with her special guests about the United Way and how you can help out. We've got a lot of news to cover from both North Carolina and Southside Virginia. As a matter of fact, our first two stories will be across the state line, one north of the state line, another south of the state line. Let's go ahead and get started. The Danville Register and B is reporting that a Danville jury has sentenced Michael Jamie Womack to 10 years in a Virginia prison for the second degree murder of his own mother. Womack was convicted in Danville Circuit Court, that was this afternoon, of second degree murder in the 1996 beating death of his mother, Lorraine Bessie Womack. Now, according to the Register and B's coverage of the trial, Womack's defense team rested this morning, and that's when closing arguments